basically God saying through Job, don't blame me. I can't bless that, what you're doing. Don't blame me. Your iniquities have he- withheld these good things from you there. You know, we look at the Lord and the people, the culture. When, you know, as you think about this, we reject God. We reject His correction. We're not grateful like the, the, the Jews were there. You know, we kind of follow on that same path. But boy, let something bad happen to us. And what do we do? We shake that fist at God. Well, I'm mad at God. Well, I'm angry with God. All this bad stuff's happening to me. But at the same time, you kind of, we kind of fall into that same pattern. Spiritual adultery, ingratitude, unteachable. Rather listen to people that tell us what we want to hear and not what we need to hear. And then something bad happens, we get angry with God. So, man, those guys really love it when you just open one of the prophets up and just go line upon line. So I'm going to do a little bit. I'm going to do that with you today. So uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, and I put a title on it because that's kind of what the title of the Bible would have, but Searching for a Righteous Man. Now, a little background with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called as a very young man to be a prophet in the southern kingdom. Southern kingdom is Judah there. And so God called him as a young man to be a prophet. And basically he spent his whole life preaching judgment, judgment coming. That's why sometimes you just kind of, you can get, well, even today, it's not the most positive message I'm bringing to you. Sorry, guys, but it is God's work. And I hope you get something out of it. But um, as a young man, he was called to, to preach, to be a prophet. And basically his whole ministry was warning people, uh, you know, up to 40 years of ministry, warning people of judgment to come. That's got to be a tough ministry, especially when you don't win many converts. And another thing God told him too, said, oh yeah, by the way, you're never going to marry and you're never going to have kids. Now that's tough, especially back in those days. Why would God do that? Different reasons, but, but uh, one of the reasons maybe that, uh, that he would stand out. Somebody that didn't marry and have kids kind of stand, stood out in those days, uh, and more, much more so in the day. But people would listen to him. So the people, you know, hey, who is this guy? He's not a family man. He just goes around preaching judgment all the time. That's kind of what he did. And uh, there, he, his ministry... And you read it, and again, in, in Jeremiah, and some of the stuff we read here today is like poetry, like dark poetry in a way there. And in that, he's warning his people, that God, through Jeremiah, is warning his people of judgment coming. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share. Lord, as we look into your word, we thank you, Father, that uh, we can... Uh, as we look into your word, that it speaks to our heart, that it brings instruction, that it brings encouragement, that it brings warnings that help us to be a better person if we would just hide it in our heart, God, so that we wouldn't sin against you. So help us today as we go through this, Lord, and uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 and 2, and uh, it says, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, Seek now and know, and seek in her open places, if you can find a man. If there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Talking about Judah. Though they say as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. So basically God's telling Jeremiah, I want you to go throughout Judah. Southern Kingdom, I want you to go through, go into all the streets of Jerusalem there and find me a righteous man there. Show me someone who really cares. And if I find somebody that really cares, I'll pardon this whole city. Over a righteous person. I'll pardon this whole Southern Kingdom here, Judah. Find a righteous person there. It's almost like in a backwards kind of way, uh, you know, when Abraham was bargaining with God 
over Sodom and Gomorrah. You know that story? When, when, um, when God spoke to Abraham and said, I'm going to wipe out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to burn them down. And uh, Abraham started bargaining, would you do it for 50? Would you do it for 40? Would you still do it? That kind of thing. Well, this is kind of, you know, uh, God laying it out there said, hey, Jeremiah, go find me a righteous person here in this whole city. And if you find me a righteous person here, then uh, I'll, I'll pardon the whole region, uh, the whole southern kingdom there. Verse two said, verse 2, yet they swear falsely. In other words, when he says they swear falsely, he said, what you're going to find when you start doing this, Jeremiah, is you're going to find a whole lot of religious people. And there's no shortage there. Religious folk, you find them everywhere. People, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm a believer. Yeah, I'm a Christian, you know. And uh, that's just kind of a, what people say. Well, I believe in God and I will go to, you know, I was, some people say I was raised in church. Well, what does that mean? You know, raised in church so, so, means different things to different people. So some people it means, you know, they went to church every so often as they were coming up. And, uh, you know, uh, and so that's what they talk about raised in church. And uh, it's funny, that whole definition about regular church attendance has changed as well. Regular church attendance used to be two or three times a week. Now it's two or three times a month. Is called is regular, and I'm not kidding. I mean, that's a, the statistics say that. You know, people that call themselves regular church attenders a couple of times a month, and so it means different things to different people. But there's a difference between having a relationship with the Lord and being religious, and that's what God told Jeremiah. You're gonna find a lot of re religious folk out there, but find me somebody that's truly righteous there. And uh, so this prompted a prayer of Jeremiah's from verse 3. And let's look at verse 3. O Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock, and they have refused to repent. Or to return, your Bible might say, but they basically talking about repent. They have refused to repent. You've consumed them, but they refuse to take correction. And that's one of the most, I guess, frightening things about human nature there. And I wish we could say they. But we got to say we and put that in there as well. God warns us, but we don't listen. Hello. He, he sends us warnings and we won't listen. He instructs us. But we don't heed his instruction there. We pretty much close our ears to it. Now, obviously, there's no one going to reach sinless perfection, so we're not talking about that. But I, my hope is this in my life, that if I begin to drift, then the Holy Spirit begins to nudge me. And I begin to, and I can receive that correction and change my ways. If I begin to drift a little bit, I get in the Word, and the Word gives me some instruction, and I will change my ways and get back in line, and that I can become that person that God can work through and use, and uh, and His will can be done in my life. But if I refuse to receive the correction of the Lord, then I'm going to continue to drift. I'm going to get a hard heart, and it will be useless to God. And I'm going to get out myself in a bunch of mess too, probably. Verse 4 and 5. Therefore I said, surely these are poor, they're foolish, and they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. I will go to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and the burst the bonds. You know what he's saying right there? Jeremiah finally, he, he went around looking. Kind of, I guess, maybe in his crowd a little bit, amongst kind of the people he associated with, the poor. But he says, I've been looking in the wrong place, maybe. He said, I've been looking at the poor and uneducated. Let me go to the rich folk, to the movers and the shakers and the master's degrees and the PhDs and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to look for that. And so he went, after looking at the common man, he went and looked at the 
you know, the well-to-do man. And you know what he found? Sophisticated sinners. That's what he found. And obviously we all believe education is good. I have some education and I, you know, encourage my kids to have education when they, you know, to go on to college and all that, paid college bills and the whole bit. So I believe in that. And I, all more power to you there. And so education is good, but, you know, sometimes education, all it does is make people more sophisticated in their rebellion against God. This is a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, you know, uh, one of our presidents. He said, any, un- any uneducated man can steal from a boxcar. But an educated man can find a way to steal the whole railroad. And so education sometimes and, and status gives you uh, the opportunity to do more and bigger things there as well. And so Jeremiah realized education didn't fix the problem. And he said, verse 5, these have all alike had the broken yoke and the bursted bond. Verse 5, uh, uh, yeah, he said that these have all together had the broken yoke and the bursted uh, bonds there and what when he's talking about the broken yoke he's talking about a uh, the, the ox the workhorse the tractor of that day the uh, you know uh, there and he basically is giving us a picture there of what a, of an ox was used to plow and put that yoke upon him but imagine trying to get a yoke on an ox to do his job in those days and the ox was resistant and kicked and jerked and 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 all kinds of things and fought back no matter how much the farmer tried to put the ox on the yoke, the yoke, the yoke, the ox will not allow it. And uh, what can you do with that? You can't do anything with that. That makes some ox steaks out of it, you know, and I don't know how good those are. And so with, with, when, you're, when you can't receive correction from the Lord, then you can't do his purpose. Like the ox wouldn't receive the correction, wouldn't put the yoke on. He, he didn't fulfill his purpose. And so when we get our position where we don't listen to the Lord and we don't receive his correction, then we're getting pretty much kind of useful for what God put us here on the earth. So even the great men of Jerusalem would not submit to God. Per, you know, a person that is of education and that is of means and has some kind of status can do some great things from God, can use that status you know, uh, for good and make an impact in the kingdom of God. But an unsubmitted man can do the same thing uh, on the other end, can do a whole lot of damage, can lead a whole lot of people astray, you know, can can use his influence to change people's minds and change people's ways and change government. It's what's been happening in our world today. Look at verse 6. Therefore, a lion from the forest shall slay them. A wolf from the desert shall destroy them. A leopard will watch over the cities. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn in pieces. Because the transgressions are many, their backslidings are increased. How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those that are not gods. When I have fed them to the full, they, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops and harlots' houses. And they were like, well-fed, lusty stallions, and everyone uh, neighed after his neighbor's wife. Whoo, that's getting a little graphic, isn't it? And so I said it's kind of a poetry-like thing, giving us a picture. God's given us a picture of the judgment that, is, that is, he's going to bring upon the southern kingdom if they don't repent. And it's an interesting picture here. Like in verse 6, he talks about a lion from the forest, a wolf from the desert, a leopard is watching them. Most people, the scholars say, well, this is something symbolic, you know. This is symbolic of the waiting judgment that's out there. And yeah, that sounds good. I go along with that as well. But another thing that was going to happen, and it did happen, because it came. Warnings after warnings after warnings after warnings, year after year after year after year, it finally came. And so we can sit back and I have people say, well, I've been hearing that all my life, type stuff. 
But it's coming. If we don't repent as a nation. And it came. And it, when it came, it came quickly. Just like in Revelation. When it came, it comes quickly. Read the Revelation. It will finally come. There. And it came. And what happened was, not only were there hundreds of thousands of people killed when Babylon came and invaded... But all, it, and then they took, as, as people didn't know, they, they took them captive, marched them off to Babylon, chained them. Some of them say they put like a hook in their nose and ran it through, and they had to walk in line and, and marched them off to Babylon. And they were there for 70 years. And so that whole region was pretty much left desolate. And there were actually uh, vi- uh, cities and towns that never rebuilt. And that's what he's talking about. There's nothing there but animals to roam around. Archaeologists have proven that. There was a lot in the southern kingdom other than Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital city, the, the major city. But there's that whole region there. There was basically communities and towns and I guess maybe what we might call cities that never rebuilt. And there just wasn't any place but a habitat for animals to roam around there in there. And uh, they were just left desolate. Verse 7, he said, your children have forsaken me uh, when I fed them full. Judah's sin, what made Judah's sin so bad was they were the chosen of God. And God blessed them and blessed them. You read about it in the Bible and all the blessings because they were God's people there. And God said, I filled you to the full. You are my chosen one. I blessed you with blessing upon blessing upon blessing there. And uh, all I got back was a lot of ingratitude. God had been so good to them that they had ignored him and turned their back on him. You know, those of us that, some of you are currently raising children, but those that have raised children and currently raising children or, uh, or will raise children, one of the things we always want to teach them is gratitude, right? I went off to a family reunion this past weekend, one of those three-day family reunions that my wife's side of the family have uh, every other year. It's pretty, pretty cool, you know, when that many people get together. We have a church service together because tons of Christians uh, you know, in, in her, her side of family, but I, lots of kids. It's just cool, and uh, I heard it this weekend, you know, more than a couple of times. What do you say? <laughs> Thank you. But we teach our kids to do that, like our mom and dad taught us to do, or should have taught us to do. But they, more than likely, they did. Because we want them to appreciate what they get. Well, God's the same way. He wants us to truly appreciate, you know, what we get. And he said, I've blessed you. I've given you blessings and filled you to the full. And you're full of a bunch of uh, ingratitude. And as believers, we ought to be just swimming in an ocean of gratitude. Think about how many chances God has given us. Think about the blessings that we have. Just a blessing to be in this country, to be you know, in a place where we can worship Him freely. Think about that there. We ought to be swimming in an ocean of gratitude, and that's kind of what He was telling them. Everything that He had given you know, Jerusalem, everything He had given them, and they didn't care. They just turned their back on it there. And He said again, your children have forsaken me when I fed them to the full. Instead of, go, and it goes on to talk about, that's where it gets a little graphic, instead of being grateful, they've committed spiritual uh, adultery. It's interesting in the Bible that God uses adultery as a picture of people going after other gods. False word. You know, that's one of the main reasons God marched them off captivity it was because they were worshiping false gods and it took 70 years of burn out out of them and so he uses adultery as a picture of their idolatry to describe uh, their idolatry he did it for two reasons because uh, he regards he did then he more so now 
He regards his relationship with his people as a marriage covenant. Just like with us, it's like entering into a marriage covenant. I'm going to a wedding in two weeks. Another Saturday, I'm going to miss football. But <laughs> I hate to think that way, but I just missed it this Saturday because it's a family reunion. Catch a little bit here and there. I sit down too long to watch it. And my wife gets me. You've got to get up from there. You're going to sit there and watch TV. Go have some fun with family. And so, you know, guys, you get married. I, don't do it in the fall of the year on a Saturday. But uh, and uh, so anyway, it's my nephew getting married, and he's a good Christian guy. So it's a happy event. But they're, they're going to covenant with each other. I'm going to be with you the rest of my life, the rest of your life, whichever comes first there. I'm going to be de devoted to you. I'm going to be committed to you. I'm going to seek the highest good for you. You know, it's a covenant that enters. And that's like what we enter in when you come to the Lord. It's a, it's a, God compares it to a marriage covenant. And when you drift away, especially those going after other gods, and when we go after other things except you know, the Lord, then he calls that adultery. And they were going after God, the God, one God named Baal, another Ashroth, and another uh, Molech. False gods. And that God of Molech required child sacrifice. Think about that. You know, that's the thing about, you know, I heard this, it's pretty cool. Maybe you've heard it. You know, I asked this, and a lot of guys at Freedom Challenge do the answer to this. They shouted it out, but I said, somebody said, um, it was Greg Laurie, a minister out of California. I was looking at his feed there on YouTube, and he said, I could take all, he was talking about true Christianity, because he was describing, like this guy, Elon Musk, that, that you know, one of the smartest guys in the world, and, you know, the Tesla, and all that, you know. And uh, he's speaking, actually he's backing Trump, which is something, but he's, uh, he's also talking about his own life. He said, I'm a cultural Christian. And so Rick, Greg Larry was trying to describe that, you know, what a cultural Christian was. It's afraid to say it's not a true believer, but it's a good step in the right direction. But he was just talking about true and false, you know, religion, I guess you would use the word religion. But he said, I could take all the religions of the world and describe them in one two-letter word. All the false, relig false religions of the world. And describe them in a two-letter word. Let's see if you know that two-letter word. They, they knew it at Freedom Challenge. What is that word? That's two letters. Do. Because with false religions, even here what we see... Whatever level. I mean, that's the most radical, sacrificing kids to Moloch. But with false religions, it's do. You got to always do something. You, you got to work your way there. Whether it's getting on a bicycle in a white shirt and riding around and going door to door. You say, man, I really admire those guys. Well, yeah, that one sense, yeah. On the other sense, they have to do that. And so, with false religion is always trying to ascend up. He said, I can describe true religion or true, true relationship or Christianity. I can also describe that in one word. It's got more than two letters. I guess it's kind of got four letters. Yeah, four words. Four. Done. Done. There you go. You're getting it. Done. Jesus Christ did it all. After he did it all, ascended into the heaven, took the blood, the one final atonement, accepted by God the Father. Then he went over there and he said, have a seat, son. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. He sat down because his work was done. And what is he up to these days? He ever liveth to make intercession for you and me. But the work is done. And so... You know, they were turning to these false gods, Molech. I just can't even imagine that. I'm hung up here for a minute. I mean, God said you, you, you caused them to pass through the fire. You caused your children to pass through the fire. And there's different opinions on what all that means, but I kind of believe it was like two giant fires. And they would, as they descend, 
you know, as, it, as a father's taking his kid to give him to the priest, the Molech priest, they walk between the two things of fire, gives his kid over, kisses his mother, a statue of Molech. Nobody got to go into that inner sanctum part of the, there unless they were taking their kid and hands their kid over. And the priests are beating the drums because they're beating the drums so loud as the father turns and walks away so he can't hear his kid scream. Imagine that. Why did they do that? They did it out of fear. It was appeasement. Because if they didn't do that, the rest of their kids might die. There'd be a curse on their Appeasement. Woo. Mm. And there's different, you know, if you read, I love to read about missionaries and, you know, especially, you know, pioneer missionaries, those that, you know, years, you know, hundreds of years ago took the gospel out and they run, they run into all this demon worship and all that and they just, you know, in the, some of these different places and it, it just came down to appeasement. They were doing all this crazy stuff, people giving their livelihood away and all that just to appease the gods, the false gods. And so to turn to all that, God said, you're just in an adulterous relationship. And then when he's talking about another adultery, you know, a spiritual adultery, but it was actually actual adultery because so much of the worship of that, of those false gods was taught, all kind of sexual perversion was tied up in all of that. And they had temple prostitutes. So guys would go to do their worship and all that. And they'd have to pay the one of the temple prostitutes and all that, uh, you know, stuff going on there. And so there was, God was calling them out on it. Spiritual adultery and actually literal adultery there. And he said in verse 7, they committed adultery and trooped to the houses of whores. And that's a, that's a, man, that's a powerful description right there. In other words, he said, you just lined up like a troop of soldiers going to the whorehouse. That's what he's basically saying. And you're doing that as a part of worship? And this is kind of that's a powerful description of the of a very large problem there, and you know the the uh, uh, term here you know harlot was used and or whore he's talking about prostitute and all that, but uh, actually a name that was used a Canaanite let's use the Canaanite when they were talking about the cultic prostitute you know what they called their cultic prostitutes with all that holy women. Think of the perversion, holy women here. And God said, no, I'm not going to share that name with anybody. He pretty much called them what they were, harlots. There. Verse 9. Shall I punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? There's your question. Shall I? Is this punishable, what we see going on year after year after year after year? And Jeremiah looked around at the poor, then he looked at the rich, and he couldn't find a righteous man. Instead, he found organized troops lined up to go to, to, the, to the harlots as part of their ritualistic worship there. And basically, he asked the question to Jeremiah, is this country not right for, work, for judgment of God? And again, we're not talking about 25 years, 35 years, up to 40 years of warnings for this to go on. And that's the thing. God will call attention and call attention a long time before judgment comes. Why? Because he's a merciful God. That's why. He's a loving God. That's why. He gives chance after chance. You know, he's going through the Gospels there and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus and all. And right there at the last, I still feel he had one more chance. And when Jesus called him out at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he looked at him and said, what you do, go do it quickly. But I believe right there, if, if he had dropped to his knees, there would have been repentance. I think, you know, all the way up to the end there, the thief on the, there's always the chance. He gives a chance, he gives a chance, he gives it till he doesn't. Because you know what it was basically happening right towards the end? 
Jeremiah was saying, don't fight. Don't fight them. Here comes Nebuchadnezzar. Here comes the army. They're doing siege warfare. And that's where they surround a city and try to starve them out. <clears throat> and when they get to a point, they start pounding that wall, you know, to crumble a hole so they go in. But, you know, for weeks and weeks, they starve them out. Siege warfare. You know what Jeremiah was saying? When other people were going, fight, fight. You know, God's with us. He was going, no, he's not. <laughs> Give up. You'll be a whole lot better off. Give up. You're going to be marched off to to uh, Babylon, but it's going to be better than sitting here and being destroyed and killed and starved even before that. And so God gives chance after chance after chance after chance until he doesn't. And so they were about, you know, in Jeremiah, they got, they got to that point by the end of the book of Jeremiah <clears throat> there. And, you know, we can say, well, we can look around and say, uh, well, our country's right for judgment. And he, uh, yeah as well. You say, well, I've been hearing that again and again and again and again, and I've been hearing it too. And you look, but man, it's getting, <laughs> whew, it's getting crazy. I'm, I'm 63 years old now. The things I see today, you know, I, I, I go back 20, 30, and especially 40 years ago, uh, back to that, and I couldn't even imagine the, these, these kind of things going on, how crazy and insane. It's kind of like, you know, in, in the book of Daniel, when uh, the, the king, and uh, that was Nebuchadnezzar, wasn't it? But anyway, he looked out over his vast empire, and the Bible says, you know, that he went nuts. He went crazy. He went insane. Some kind of way. They said he grazed on grass in the field and acted like an animal. You say, did that really happen? Was that just symbolism? of how crazy he got. But we know one thing, he went insane. And the history will say there were several years where there was no uh, writings in, the chron in, in, in his chronicles or anything until he looked up and acknowledged God. But he was looking out at all he did himself. He was looking at the great hanging gardens, one of the seven wonders of the world. He was just admiring all of that. He went insane. And the object of that, I heard a preacher say this too. He got... The farther we get away from God, the more insane we get as a nation. And you look at some of the insanity. One of our directors, there's a new director up there in, in uh, Kansas. He, he, he really, we, we hired him and he really researched out where to live, where the best schools were. He still got a couple of kids in school. A daughter that's six, I think she just turned 16. But another one that's 11 or 12 now. And so he... He, uh, so he got a house in the good part over there where the good schools were. Well, he just pulled his kids out of that good school. Because <laughs> they got this thing that, you know, there's many different reasons, but one of the things, I never heard of this one. I, it was a new one on me. That, you know, all this thing, well, if you identify as a female, you can be a female. If you identify as a male, you know, all this kind of stuff. You know, don't use pronouns, call people we and they, and all this kind of crazy stuff. But there's these kids that identify as cats. <laughs> this is a thing. You, I'd never heard of this one. And yeah, these kids are in the church, and, and this is where this 10-year-old, 10, 11-year-old, 10, you know, and they identify, and so the teachers were kind of encouraging, so they're going out and acting like cats, these girls in school. Now, is that not insane? The farther we get away from God, the more insane we become as a nation. <coughs> Verse 10. You think I'm going through this whole chapter? I'm not. I'm, gonna, I'm about to jump. I'm about to skip a hunk. Here, but look at verse 10. You know, this is not a real positive message. And I'm sorry about that, guys. But uh, God always gives hope. And here he gives some hope. Verse 10. Uh, it says, uh, go, up, go up on her walls and, dest and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Take away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. For the, for the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. They have lied about the Lord and said, It is not he, neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see 
sword or famine, and the prophets become wind, and the word is not in them, thus shall it be done to them as well. And so what he's talking about here, he says, verse 10, talking about from the walls of the city, he said, these walls are going to get, get, get knocked down. And they did. They were breached and in came the Babylonian army later on in the you know, book of Jeremiah there. But in the midst of all of these warnings right here, there, God couldn't resist but to give some hope there. And uh, he's going to say, it's coming. Like I told you, it was inevitable. It got to the point, don't even resist it. It's here and all that. But God's saying it's not going to be totally over because you know what? Jerusalem, this, the city of David, this city, when it was captured and people were led away, hardly anybody was left in there. But God kept his hand on Jerusalem there. And no other of those surrounding nations, they, didn't cap, they couldn't capitalize upon it and come and inhabit it and just take Jerusalem away. God kept it. He kept it. And the reason he kept it, he kept any other invading army or any other people from coming and seizing this abandoned city so much, he kept it because he said, there's coming and you're going to come back. You're going to have to go, but I'm going to bring you back. You're going to have to go because of my judgment. You, you've done too much. And we've got to get some correction. We've got to burn all this idolatry out of you and all this stuff. But I'm going to keep my hand on Jerusalem. And nobody's going to come and take it over. And when the time is right, end up being 70 years, you're going to come back. And I'm going to start blessing you all over again back here in this city. So he, so he said, you, you will come home there. But you see, one of Jeremiah's big problems he had in that day was he wasn't the only prophet in town. There was a few others that were preaching like he was. But most of them were preaching just the opposite. So he had competition from false prophets. And what were they saying? No, 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 no. God's not going to judge us. We're God's chosen people. He is going to come to fight for us just like he did in the days of old when he would send the death angel and kill hundreds of thousands of the enemy, when he would confuse the enemy and they would turn on themselves, when he would use uh, nature itself to fight our battles. This, we're the same people and this is what's going to happen this time. We're just in a little rough patch right now. You know, we're just in a cycle of things. We're going to cycle right out of this thing as well. And uh, they were lying. It's one thing, man, what a lying preacher. They just, and, and you know what? People would rather hear that. You'd rather hear something like that. Here's Jeremiah. This guy, he don't even have no family. And he's up there preaching, using all kinds of poetry. And even with Ezekiel later, doing all kinds of uh, symbolisms and stuff over there. And, uh, and, and they, they're seeing that and they're talking about being led off captive. Man, I'd I really go over here to this church. It's more positive. You know, he's encouraged. I feel good when I come out of there. And you know, that kind of preaching has its place. But not if it's lying. It doesn't have its place. Not just to do it there. I like to hear a good positive message. And you probably want your next message to be a lot more positive than this one. <laughs> But he goes on and just says, hey, verse 22. Hey, we're jumping ahead, verse 22 there. He said, do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence, who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by perpetual decree that it cannot pass it? And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over. And he's saying right there, nature obeys me. You take this massive sea with this boundary of sand but yet it obeys this boundary of sand but you do you dare to defy me when nature won't even defy me and you you know when you think about that god has designed all of this and things submit to god but he says you dare not submit to me verse 23 it says but this people has a defiant and a rebellious heart they have revolted and departed that and departed 
Nature teaches us we can't fight against God is what he's saying there. Verse 25, your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. Now that's a heavy verse right there. Your iniquities have turned these things away. Your sins have kept good things from you. Uh, God wants to do so much. He wants to do so much more in your life there, but so much of the time, we're the ones that keep it from happening. Your sins have withheld good things from you. You know, basically at that particular time, the rain had stopped. It was all brown there, kind of like here, <laughs> you know, but been a lot longer. It's kind of normal here <laughs> this time of year. But the crops were failing. You know, there wasn't a harvest out there. And basically, God's saying through Job, don't blame me. I can't bless that, what you're doing. Don't blame me. Your iniquities have withheld these good things from you there. You know, we look at the Lord and the people, as a culture. And, you know, as you think about this, we reject God. We reject His correction. We're not grateful like the the the... Jews were there, you know, we kind of follow on that same path. But boy, let something bad happen to us, and what do we do? We shake that fist at God. Well, I'm mad at God. Well, I'm angry with God. All this bad stuff's happening to me. But at the same time, you kind of, we kind of fall into that same pattern. Spiritual adultery, ingratitude, unteachable. Rather listen to people that Tell us what we want to hear and not what we need to hear. And then something bad happens, we get angry with God. And when you look at that, I was thinking about that too there. I mentioned Revelation, which is an extreme case. When you start reading Revelation, man, some bad stuff happens on this. Whoo! I mean, plagues and just catastrophes and natural effect. God called, and the people that are there, will know it's coming from God. And you know what they do? They will look up and curse God and not repent. Just totally hard-hearted about the whole thing as well. Verse 26. For among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men as cage of full birds and their houses full of deceit. Therefore they have become great and uh, grown rich they have grown fat and they sleep and sleek yes they surpass the deeds of, of the wicked they do not plead the cause they the cause of the fatherless yet they prosper and the right of the needy they do not defend so shall i punish them for these things says the lord shall not i avenge myself on such a nation as this he's describing the fate of the people there he said you know you you people of means you have no pity on the poor there. You're catching people like a bird catcher. You're catching people. You're victimizing them. You don't care about the needy. Every, God's heart always goes out to the poor and the needy. And when we look beyond them and don't help them and reach out to them, to even those in prison, and we don't try to help them. The Bible says, he that gives to the poor lends to God. God pays, you know, you're going to lend God something? Wow, God's going to pay up. So he blesses those. But, but on the other end of that, those who just ignore it, and they get their money by their own means, and they show all kind of ingratitude to God, he notices that too. You're passing over them. That's another reason for judgment. You know, you're taking advantage of the vulnerable. You're taking advantage of the needy, and those that are defenseless there. And then we kind of got to the last two verses of the Bible, and everybody go, I'm the, I got there. I fast-tracked it. Verse 30 and 31. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. That's a crazy thing. But what will you do 
in the end. That's a horrible thing being committed in the land he's talking about. The prophets prophesy falsely. We've already talked about that. They claim to be speaking in the name of the Lord, saying the exact opposite, tickling their ears and making people feel better about themselves when they should be telling them the truth. He said the priests rule by their own power. They don't lead by love. It's all about power and prestige with them. But the worst of that is my people love to have it so. That's just astonishing. It's a wonder to you know, have false prophets, but we've always had false prophets down through the years. It's a wonder that there's religious leaders building their own kingdoms, but we've always had that down through the years. But the crazy thing about it is my people love to have it so. You know, throughout church history and all the way back in the book of Acts, there were charlatans, spiritual tyrants, and you know, it's nothing new. But people still run to them. They still run to them. You know, man, there's ministers today, I mean, private jets flying around. One man not only has his own private jet, he's got his own private airstrip. I'm talking about it's like an airstrip recognized by air traffic controllers and all that. And where is it? It was right behind his house. And he's got two or three other planes there too. And, and he, he listens to some of them speak and they're just bragging. A lot of their sermons is bragging. I was looking at one and he was bragging about this. It wasn't a Rolex, but it was another watch, beer line or beer line or something like that, a very expensive watch. And I said that wrong, didn't I? I said, I don't even know. I got a Tomex. <laughs> but uh, he said that he has 36 of them. So a lot of their messages are bragging. And of course, they're pre hey, you can do this too if you're spiritual enough. That's kind of what he's saying. It's like, you know, and that's some of the extreme cases, but people, you know, people still following after that. And they're happy to follow after somebody that half of his sermon is bragging about what he has. My people love to have it so. Here's the question, guys, and bringing it to a close. What will you do in the end? How did this chapter begin? Jeremiah was searching for a righteous man. One who might execute judgment. One who would do what is true. And if he found that righteous man, God said, I'll, I'll forgive this whole region. I'll pardon you. But he didn't find one. Well, let me tell you something. I found one. And hopefully you found a righteous man there. We found the righteous one. And guess what? When we found the righteous one, he pardoned us. We put our trust in the righteous one, and he pardoned us. Jesus of Nazareth. When we do that, pardon will come, and transformation will come. So let's stand. So Jeremiah, he went looking for a righteous man. He was just a few hundred... He found, he was just a few hundred years early. Because a few hundred years after this, what we're talking about today in the book of Jeremiah, a few hundred years after that, a righteous man came and walked those very streets. And he gave his life for us. Jesus, of the, he gave his life for us, the true, true righteous one. He gave his life for us. He, he, he died upon Calvary. Hill, right near there where all this we're talking about with Jeremiah. Hundreds of years later, Jesus walked that. And like I said, he did the work. And he sat down. And now we need to trust in the righteous one. And we too will be pardoned as well. So the work is done. And the Bible says, now through him, we can be a righteous person.
He's the righteous one, but he pardons us and he transforms us. And the Bible calls us the righteousness of God. Wow, just think of that. Jeremiah was just looking around for one. And in Jesus, we're all around here today. If you put your trust in Jesus, he's pardoned you. He's transformed you. You're righteous in him. And if you hadn't done that today, you got opportunity. We just found the answer. The whole message started, who can find a righteous man? Searching for a righteous one. Jeremiah went searching in the poor, searching in the uneducated, searching in the rich, searching in the educated. Couldn't find anybody. We found him, and you can find him too this morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all you do for us. You have been good, good, good to us. You're a good, good father. Forgive us, Lord, of committing adult, spiritual adultery against you about turning not necessarily to false gods, but turning to things and putting them in front of you in importance, whether it be a thing, a person, a position. We put them in front of you, God. We show in gratitude just like them, Lord. Just like they did in Judah. We show in gratitude. And, and we don't listen to correct your correction, as you said. So, Lord, we would like to say they, they, they. But, Lord, we look around and we say we, we, we. We're a part of this as well. But, Lord, what we want to be is that person that does heed your correction. And though we may begin to drift, maybe just in our mind in the beginning, that we receive your correction and straighten things up before it ever even goes anywhere, Lord. And we become a vessel that you can use, a vessel of honor for you, Lord. And we thank you for that. So if you haven't received him, if you haven't received the righteous one, if you hadn't found the righteous one, I invite you to find the righteous one today and be pardoned and be transformed. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. Amen.